All right, well, good morning, High Point. How are we? Let's go, let's go. Listen, I want to begin uh, by addressing the elephant in the room. Um, I know what all of you are thinking, and the answer is yes. Uh, those are actually my abs. My real abs are, they didn't CGI that at all. Um, that's actually how I look. Um, no, actually, uh, uh, David Tigret, he's, he's actually leading worship over at Carville uh, this morning, and he is the one who puts together all of our bumpers. So let's go ahead and give David a round of applause. Um, he is extremely, extremely gifted. But yes, yeah, so last night he sends me uh, this, this video. He's like, hey, what do you think? So I show Lily, and I'm like, Lily, now before I show you this, you just have to see how realistic this is. Like, it's crazy how he just knew. He, he just knew, right? So she rolled her eyes, and if there's one thing we know, is that haters are gonna hate, right? Like, that's just, that's just how it is. Listen, um, if, uh, if you're new here, uh, my name is Will, and I serve as one of the pastors here on staff. And here's what we want you to know. Uh, regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, uh, whether you are unchurched and this church experience is the first time you're ever doing any of this, right? Or maybe uh, you're de church. Maybe you grew up in church and, and walked away for a really long time and you're finally giving it another shot. Or maybe uh, you've been church your whole life, you've been a church attender. We want you to know uh, that regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, regardless of where you are in your spiritual walk, High Point Church is a safe place for you. And one of the things that we like to say here, and you see it as you walk in through our doors on our welcome mats, is the phrase, welcome home. And, and we mean that, that regardless of where you are, regardless of where you are coming from, maybe Easter or Good Friday was the first time you've ever been in this building, or maybe you're watching online for the first time. And we want you to know that regardless of where you are in your journey, on your walk, uh, we want you to know that here at High Point, you are welcomed home. Amen? Amen. Now, this morning, uh, we are starting a brand new multi-week sermon series entitled Battle ready, battle ready. And what we're doing in this series is we are going to be looking at spiritual warfare through the lens of Ephesians chapter six. We are going to be looking at spiritual warfare through the lens of the armor of God. Now, there are two primary reasons why we are doing this series. The, the first reason is more corporate and public and the second reason is more private and personal. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the first reason here on the front end, and then I'm gonna give you the second reason later on in the sermon. But, but the first reason why we are doing this series on spiritual warfare um, is a corporate reason. It's, it's a public corporate reason. Here's what I mean. Um, I've been here at High Point, I checked the calendar uh, last night. I've been here at High Point for exactly 18 months. Now, those 18 months have felt like more like five years, okay? I, I know it's only 18 months, but I feel like I've been here five years. No, nothing that you guys, no, you guys have done nothing wrong, uh, but, but it's, it's been easily, hands down, uh, the hardest 18 months of my life for, for many, many reasons. Some of you may know some of them. Maybe you've never met me. I have no idea uh, what those are, but it's been the hardest 18 months of my life. Uh, but what I would say is that these last 12 months in particular have probably been the hardest, right? Ever since the global pandemic started, uh, right after that, a few months after that, uh, we had a very divisive political season and uh, your pastor decided to do a four week series right in the middle of all that. And so that wasn't helpful. And uh, maybe it was for you, it wasn't for me. Um, and so this has been a very long 12 months. And I would argue that the last few months have probably been the hardest of the 12 months because uh, I guess many of you know, uh, back in the December time period, well actually you can go all the way back to September. It's at the August, September time, my grandfather passed. Uh, and then my grandmother passed, and then I had COVID and was, uh, and had, was in the hospital for pneumonia. Then my dad got COVID and put on life support. Um, and then if you remember, just a few weeks ago, we did a series on suffering uh, because as a church, we were under a very intense season of suffering. And I listed all the names and all the families that had experienced suffering and loss. 
with one of our staff members, during that time, I didn't share this in that sermon, but during that time, out of our almost 40, roughly 40 staff members, 12 of them had COVID at the exact same time, okay? And one of them, Trisha Leggett, ended up passing away um, as a result, which is why we did the series or that message on suffering to begin with. And so this season has been very, very difficult. And so I would argue that part of the reason why we are doing this series is because of where we've been. Uh, but I would also argue that we are also doing this series not just because of where we've been, but because of where we are going, where we are going. Now, now what do I mean by that? Well, I personally, um, even though these 18 months have been really hard, I personally have never been more excited about the future of our church than I am right now. And as my wife and I were talking last week, getting through Good Friday, going into Easter, uh, she, she mentioned something to me um, on Saturday. She said, you know, it almost feels like Good Friday was the closing of a season and then Easter was the starting of a brand new season, right? And, and I can relate to that. Like, I, I, I feel that. And, and God moved in an incredible way during the weekend. And, and so I feel like we as a church are heading into a very different season than from the one that we just came from. You know, one of the things that people talk about and Christians use all the time is, oh, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And I've always been very weary with that statement because I think that's true in that one day we're going to be in heaven, right? So long term, the best is yet to come. But we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know. And no one knew going into 2020 that we were going to experience what we experienced. The best is yet to come was not an accurate statement, right? But, but here's why I feel that I'm more excited than ever about where God is leading us and why I feel that this series is so important and so strategic. All the way back in last summer, um, I had time to get away. Usually around the month of July, my family and I get away. And I had time to pray and process and read and, and really just seek the Lord. And, and during that time of praying and seeking the Lord, um, I was in a, in a very tough time in my ministry. Like I was very, very close to burnout. And like I was literally just be like, I don't know if this is for me. And what's interesting is one of the things I've learned uh, over the past few weeks, I was listening to this podcast, and in the podcast, uh, what, what the guy said, he's a, a leadership guy, he said that 30% of pastors who were in ministry before COVID started will be out of ministry by this fall. 30% of pastors will be out of ministry by this fall. Like, that's how hard this season has been for people in ministry. And so last summer, I kind of hit a wall. And uh, the God, God allowed me to have time away, and I got time to pray and process. And the Lord convicted me, and here's what he convicted me with. What he said to me was, the reason why you feel like you are burning out and the reason why you feel like you can't do ministry anymore is because you're not actually doing any ministry at all. Now that you are a mega church pastor, all you do is lead meetings and give TED Talks on the weekend. That's all it is. Like, that's what a mega church pastor is. I don't know if you knew that, but that's the role uh, that they play. And so he's like, you're not actually doing any ministry, and that's why you want to leave, because you didn't sign up for this. I called you to do something totally different. So, so during that season, I began praying, and I began seeking the Lord. And through reading books and through prayer, I started becoming more and more convinced that we as High Point have to go somewhere where we've never been before. And what I mean by that is we have to become a disciple-making church. And the Lord gave me a vision. Here's the vision that the Lord gave me. The Lord gave me this vision that every high pointer, if someone is going to call themselves a high pointer, they have to be one and make one. Every high pointer has to be a disciple and make a disciple. And so from that moment, I started praying and I started planning and I started processing. And I, through prayer and just through a lot of time, I created this five-tier uh, discipleship plan that we're going to be rolling out in the fall. I don't know about you, but I've been in a lot of churches that talk about discipleship, right? But then when you look at it, they're not really doing any type of discipleship, right? So after praying and processing, I felt very convicted to take that to our staff. And so I did. Then I took it to our elders. And last year, right around August, um, my elders and I, we got on our knees over at the Carville lobby because we were social distancing still. We got down on our knees and we prayed over this plan. And for the last year, we have been working as a staff, as an elder board, preparing for what God is going to do through us going into the fall. Why do I share that with you? Well, I share that with you because when we decide to take the word of God seriously, the enemy isn't going to like that. Wherever God is moving, Satan is counter-moving. 
That's how he works. As a matter of fact, what I've seen in many of Christians' lives, including my own, is that Satan tends to leave me alone when I'm not doing anything that threatens his kingdom. But what I'm realizing more than ever, here's what's crazy, is that from the moment that God gave me that vision for High Point Church, and it wasn't my vision, it's the biblical mandate, the Great Commission, from that moment on is when my grandfather passed, and then my grandmother passed, and then I got sick, and then my dad got sick, and then my staff got sick, and then one of our staff members, like from that moment on, like when we decided that we were going to be a New Testament Great Commission church, the spiritual warfare began. And so I am telling you this, not so you can feel bad for us, but I'm telling you this because if you feel called to be a part of this church long term, I need you to know where we are headed. And I need you to know what we are going to be about. Over the last several months, I've been discipling six guys. And those six guys, that time with them, I now look forward to that time more than preaching a sermon on Sunday. Because now that I'm doing ministry again, which was what Jesus calls us to do, which is to make disciples, not just preach sermons and sing songs, but to make disciples... I feel more alive than ever, but what I can tell you, what I can guarantee you, is that if this is direct, the direction that we are headed, not only do I need you to strap in, but I also need you to realize that the enemy is going to attack us more than he ever has. So this series is strategic, not just because of where we've been, but because of where we are going. The enemy is going to do everything he can to stop what God is doing. Why? Because whenever God moves, Satan counter moves. That's why we are doing this series. It might not be the most important series we do, but it is easily one of the most strategic series we have ever done. Now, this morning, our passage for this message in particular, and actually for the whole series in general, is Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open those. If you have your devices, go ahead and turn those on. It'll be here on the screen behind me, and if you're watching online, on the screen below me. But we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. What we're going to do today is we are going to look at this passage under two headings. The first thing that we're going to do today is we are going to look at who we battle. Who we battle. And then after we look at who we battle, we're going to conclude by looking at how we battle. So we're beginning with who, and we're concluding with how. But I want to start today by looking at who we battle. And to do that, uh, I want to read to you um, the passage in its entirety. We're going to be from verse 10 to verse 13. Here's what it says. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand Firm. It's the word of the Lord. Uh, Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you this morning and we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for its truth. And Father God, I pray right now, Lord, it's, it's so interesting that on a morning like this, we had so many difficulties as a worship team, as a production team, even me in my own life this week. Lord, but I am not surprised because we have an enemy who hates us. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us. But we also have an enemy who has been defeated utterly and completely and totally. And so, Father, as we do this series overall and as we address this passage, this morning, I pray that from the moment I say amen, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be honoring and glorifying to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Father, I know that in my flesh and in my strength, I am weak. But the promise that we have in scripture is that when we are weak, you are strong. And so, Father, I pray that you would fill me with the spirit, that you would lead me, that you would guide me, and that you would be here among us. And we ask this and we beg this in the name of your son, Jesus, And the church said, amen. Amen. So we're going to begin today by looking at who we battle. Now, according to the Bible, according to Scripture, spiritual warfare started all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. 
In Genesis chapter 3, we find the story of Adam and Eve, and they're in the garden, and everything is great. They have a fellowship with God. Sin has yet to enter the world. And we are told that a serpent shows up, the serpent being Satan, uh, the serpent being Lucifer. He's a serpent at the beginning uh, in Genesis. He's also a serpent at the end in Revelation. But he shows up as a serpent, and he tempts Eve. And then Adam, instead of leading his wife, instead of protecting his wife, he falls into temptation as well. So when Adam and Eve sin against God and they fall into temptation, in Genesis 3, verse 15, God, he says to Satan, he promises two things in one verse, in Genesis 3, 15. He promises on the one hand that there will be a continued en en uh, enmity between humanity and Satan. So he, one thing he promises is continued enmity. And the other thing that he promise, that promises is certain victory, all in the same verse. Continued enmity, which is the word for war and conflict between humanity and Satan. But then he also promises certain victory because he informs Satan that from this woman will one day come a seed that will crush his head. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, you and I have been in spiritual warfare. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you are in spiritual warfare. According to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are sons of God, we are servants of God, and we are soldiers of God. Now, I don't say sons and daughters of God because in scripture, it was a very unique thing. Only men were adopted. So for God to call a woman a son, that you've been adopted like a son was a big thing. So I'm not saying the daughter thing on purpose because the Bible says that we have been made sons. Men and women have been made sons of God through the gospel. In the gospel, we are sons of God. We are servants of God. But one of the things that we tend to overlook is that we are also soldiers of God. We are in a spiritual battle according to scripture. Now, now that we've I've kind of laid out the groundwork and have acknowledged that we are in battle, that we are at war, the question that we have to answer next is, who are we battling? Like, who are we at war against? Well, according to this passage, verse 11 and verse 12, we are at war against Satan and his demons. That is who we are at war against. Why is that important? Because in any game, in any war, in any, in any fight, it's important for you to know who your enemy is. You have to know what their strengths are. You have to know what their weaknesses are. You have to know what their offense is so that then you can set up a proper defense. And according to this passage, our enemy, our enemies are Satan and demons. Now, here's the thing about Satan. The first time we come across him in scripture, I already mentioned, is in Genesis chapter 3. But when you read the entirety of the, New Test of the Old Testament, what you actually discover is that Satan was there way before Genesis 3. When you look at Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, what you discover is that Satan was actually a chief angel. He was a guardian cherub in heaven. And then what we discover from those two chapters is that over time, he started to grow in pride. He, he started to grow in arrogance. And he's like, why would I worship God if I can be like God? Which ironically is the same way he tempted Eve. The same thing that tempted him is the same thing he used to tempt Eve. Why worship God, Eve, if you can be like God, right? And so what he does is he uses his influence to take one third of the angels. He essentially uh, raises up a rebellion and he seeks to usurp and take God's throne, his power, his glory. God's not having it. And so God, it says that God kicks him out of heaven. And this is actually the same story that Jesus is referencing in the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus says to the disciples, the disciples are like, Jesus, you're not going to believe it. Uh, you know, all these demons are, are being casted out and they're, they're celebrating. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So Jesus, just as a passing comment, Jesus is such a baller, that as a passing comment, he was like, oh, yeah, I was there when Satan lost. I was there when Satan got kicked out. Like, I saw the whole thing. Right? That's just a side comment in the gospel. That's what Jesus says. 
Jesus is referencing that moment. Ever since then, uh, Satan and demons have been actively trying to do two things. Since that moment, since he was removed from heaven, he's been actively trying to do two things. The, the first thing he's been actively trying to do is oppose God's work. The second thing that he's been actively trying to do is pervert God's word. Right now, Satan's working and he's doing it in two ways. By opposing God's work and by perverting God's word. That's what he does in the garden. He shows up in the garden. He tries to oppose what God is doing, his work, but then he also perverts what God says, his word. And that's what Satan has been doing since the beginning. When we look at the New Testament, there are several different descriptors that tell us who he is. In scripture, he is described, to, described as the liar, as the accuser, as the tempter, as the murderer, as the uh, slanderer. Jesus says that he is a thief who came to steal, kill, and destroy. We are at war, church. And listen, you might be a pacifist, but Satan is not. The person you are battling against is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And according to this passage, he is not alone. It's not just him, but it's all the demons and fallen angels that fell with him. Now, here's the thing about Satan, though. Satan, on the one hand, is very, very strong, and yet on the other hand, he is very, very subtle. He is both strong and subtle at the same time. How do we know that he's strong? Well, according to this passage, verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle. The, the Greek word there is the word struggle. Now, here's the thing. When, when we think of wrestling, right, we think of, you know, just wrestling with our sibling on the living room floor, or we think of watching wrestling on the Olympics or maybe back in high school. It's a competition between two people. At the end of it, you get up and you walk away. The problem is, is that when you look at scripture, uh, wrestling in Paul's day was a completely different monster. It almost always happened at the Colosseum. And when it happened, get this, it was hand to hand, face to face, very, very personal combat. And the only way you would win was by choking the other person out. You would have to grab their throat and choke them out. Okay. Many times that person would die. But even if you didn't die, the punishment for losing was they would blind you for the rest of your life. That's what wrestling was back in Paul's day. So when Paul says wrestling, his readers would have immediately known the severity and the seriousness of what this battle actually was. This is a very serious battle. We have a very strong adversary. But here's the thing about Satan. Not only is he strong, but he's also very subtle. Well, how do we know? Well, because in this passage, verse 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The word there, schemes, in Greek is the Greek word methodia, which is where we get the English word methods. And literally what it means is a crafty, cunning, strategy, planning. He's, he's crafty. He, he's cunning. He's, he's sneaky. He's, he's subtle. That's how he works. So on the one hand, he's very, very strong. But he rarely flexes his muscles because according to Paul, he almost always works through schemes. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be detected. Actually, the word picture there is of a predator seeking prey. But instead of the predator just running after it and making it super overt, it's, it's doing it covert. Like it sneaks and waits and sets a trap. That's how Satan attacks you and me. And why is that important? Because what that teaches us then is that Satan is not impulsive. Satan is very strategic. He's, he, 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 makes, he makes sure he understands the plan before he does anything with it. We would think he's super impulsive and angry all the time, right? And he might be angry all the time, but he is not impulsive. He is very, very subtle. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11, he says to the Corinthians, I want to make sure that you forgive one another. Why? Verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul says, I don't want you to be outwitted 
because this strong adversary is also very strategic and subtle. Then, if you guys remember when we were in Colossians, in Colossians 2, verse 4, uh, Paul says, I am writing this to you so that you may not be convinced by reasonable or plausible arguments. In other words, when Satan gives you an argument, he rarely comes up to you with a straight lie. It's almost always a half-truth. Like there's something true about it. Like when he goes up to Eve, he, he only slightly manipulates what God says. God says, you just can't eat from this tree. And he shows up and says, did God really say you can't eat or touch any tree? You see, he, he takes what is truth from God and he just makes it a half-truth. He, he just changes it just enough to trick you with a reasonable and plausible argument. That is how Satan works. So what we see is that in many ways, Satan is, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again, in many ways, Satan is much more likely to plant a lie in your head than he is to sink his teeth into your skin. Right? When we think of Satan, we think of horror movies and we think of Ouija boards. But according to scripture, he is way more likely to plant a lie in your head than he is to sink his teeth into your skin. That's how he works. Now, the question that we have to ask then is what do these schemes look like? If Paul says that there are schemes, and in Corinthians, he talks about his designs, what do these schemes, these tactics, these strategies actually look like? Well, this week, I came across uh, a very helpful illustration, and I hope that it helps you. Uh, there's a Christian counselor. His name is uh, John White, and he used this illustration that really helped me to better understand how Satan attacks us. Now, mind you, before I share this illustration, I'm not a musical person. I've never played a piano in my life, and so I, my, my, what I might say is not accurate, but this is what he says happens when you do this, okay? He said that one of the things that singers can do is they can actually take a piano, like one of those nice ones, you lift up the top of it, and you start to sing. And depending on what note you are singing, there is a string that will start vibrating in the piano. And the, the string that starts vibrating is the one that corresponds to the pitch or the note that you are singing. Again, I've never seen this happen, so I might be lying straight to your face. But that's what the man said, okay? That when you sing, you can actually tell what your note is or what your pitch is by what string starts. You don't touch the piano at all. It'll literally start vibrating and match whatever note you are hitting. He says that's exactly how Satan works. Satan, he sings the song, and then he sees what in you starts to vibrate. And then he knows this is the key I have to press in order to take this person out. That's how he works. And so when we see that, it, that he is, we should not be ignorant of his designs, the word there, designs, it literally has to do with plotting. It has to do with investigating, with studying. So Satan is a very studious person. He's been doing it for millennia. And so he's been working on his marketing brand, his brand and his marketing, and he knows exactly what makes you stumble. He knows what your vice is. He knows what your past is. He knows how to attack you. See, one of the things that we make a big deal about in our culture is personal training, right? Someone who, who creates a personal plan to help us get better in our health. Satan is the first personal trainer. He has a very specific plan just for you. He studies you, he investigates, and then he knows exactly what to do in order to cause you to stumble. But we see that in Scripture, right? Because even in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, Paul is talking to Timothy about the choosing of elders, and he says, make sure that the elder you choose is not a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. In Ephesians 4, 27, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. The devil is always looking for opportunities. He will use your unforgiveness. He will use your anger. He will use your bitterness. He will use your past. He will use your future. He will use your family of origin. He will use whatever he has to use to steal, kill, and destroy. So like I said, you may be a pacifist, but he is not. And he is trying 
to destroy your life, especially if you're a believer, because he knows this is as close to hell as you'll ever get. And so he's going to make this hell on earth. That is what the Bible teaches about Satan. Wherever God is moving, Satan is counter moving. And that's true both personally and corporately, which is why this series is so important for the life of our church. So the first thing we see is we see who we battle. The second thing we see, and this is where I want to spend the rest of our time this morning, is I want to look at how we battle. So we've seen the who, and now I want to look at the how. Look what it says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, and then I'm going to skip to verse 13. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Everybody say, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. So we've seen who we battle. And now I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about how we battle. But before I tell you that, um, I want to take a moment, uh, a few minutes here, and I want to share with you uh, a big part of my testimony. Um, I remember what I said at the beginning. I said I had two reasons for doing this series, right? The first reason was the corporate reason. And then the second reason was a more private, personal reason. Now, if you have kids in the room, uh, you might want to earmuff it. You might want to step out. This is my story. I'm not exaggerating any of it, but it's pretty heavy, okay? So when I, let me kind of give you some background. And hopefully you're going to see some of these stories I've told here in the past, but this is me kind of combining all my stories into one so that you can see how much spiritual warfare has played a role in my life, right? And I, would, I would argue that in my life, Satan hasn't been so subtle. Okay, so my parents, so here, here's where my nationality, uh, nationality is. I am part black, part Hispanic. Uh, my dad is Cuban, and my mom is Puerto Rican. Now, I want to focus more on my dad's side of the family. My mom grew up more as a nominal Catholic, and my dad grew up in a religion called Santeria. And I'll explain what that is in a second. So my dad was born the very year that Fidel Castro took over Cuba. So my dad never knew Cuba without Fidel, right? Now, when my dad was about eight, nine years old, his father, my grandfather, the one who passed back in August, he worked as a cook at a restaurant. It was a butcher shop slash restaurant, and he worked there. And what happened was one of his coworkers uh, was stealing food from the from the shop and was bringing it home because there was no food back then. Well, when they found out, when the government found out that he was stealing, they showed up at his place of work, this guy who was stealing, and they questioned all of his coworkers. And because my grandfather didn't essentially tell the government about what his coworker was doing, they put him in jail for three years. So for three years, my grandfather, from when my, when my dad was eight years old to when my dad was 11, he was in a Cuban prison. Okay. Now, during that time, uh, my grandmother, who I'm not sure what faith she was in before that, but during that time, she really had nowhere to turn. She was a young mom with young kids. She ended up turning into this religion called Santeria. Now, here's what Santeria is. Santeria is very prevalent in Miami, in Haiti, and in Cuba. But here's what it actually is. It's actually an example of syncretism. Syncretism is a big word, but all it means is when you bring two religions and you bring them together. Two religions or two worldviews and you bring them together. Santeria is an example of syncretism. It is a combination of Roman Catholicism on the one hand and African spiritualism on the other. And here's how it started. When, when the Spaniards uh, started to essentially start take, started taking slaves, uh, they went through Africa first and took all these African slaves with them. So when they showed up in the Caribbean and started to do the same thing there, the African slaves came with them. And so what happened was one of the ways that the, uh, the, uh, the Spaniards would control you is they would force Catholicism on you. 
So what these slaves did is they actually they didn't want to lose their African spiritualism. So what they did is they took all these Catholic names and terms and they renamed the spirits they were already worshiping. So to a Spaniard, they, oh, you're Catholic, but really they were worshiping voodoo and spiritualism, right? That's how it all began. So during this time that, that my grandfather's in jail, my grandmother falls head into this, headlong into this religion or this cult is what it is, right? So fast forward a few years, my grandfather gets out of jail. Fast forward a few years from that, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, my dad, and his sister, my aunt, they move to the United States. They get on a boat, and they show up in Miami, eventually end up in the Chicago land area. When they get to Chicago, my dad meets my mom. They get married 1984. I'm born 1985. And right around 86, 87, uh, my parents decide to buy uh, a six apartment building, an apartment building with my grandparents, uh, my dad's parents, the, the Cuban side, right? So they decide to buy this apartment building right in the middle of the city of Chicago. So I essentially until about the age of nine or 10, I grew up in a big apartment building. And what was interesting about these six apartments is that almost all of them had a family in uh, one of my family members in it. So it was me, my mom, my dad, my brother in one apartment. And across the hallway was my grandmother and my grandfather. Right below us was my other grandmother and my other grandfather. Then my aunt and uncle over here. They have a whole, the whole building was my family, okay? So essentially what I'm saying to you is that nobody was paying rent, okay? There was no rent being paid the entire time. But here is what happened. When I was born, and this is another part of my story you guys have heard, but when I was born, I was born with an ear deformity called microtia. And essentially, I was born without an ear. I was born without a right ear. So from the age of five to the age of 18, I had 14 major reconstructive surgeries where they put me in, under an anesthesia. And so the ear that I have on my head is literally made from my body. The, the skin is from underneath my arms. The, the cartilage is, is from in between my ribs. So it was a full-blown surgery every time I would go in. 14 of these in 13 years, okay? Now, here's the thing. Because my grandmother was the only person in our family that took her faith seriously, even though it was a cult, here's what we would do. And again, if you have kids, this might be where you want to start earmuffing. But, but here's what we would do. I would literally, before every surgery, before every operation, we would walk across the hallway from my apartment to my grandmother's apartment, and there would be all these people from my Cuban side there, and they would essentially form a circle, and there was candles on the floor, and essentially it was a, a, a cult, it was a, a seance, it was a demonic ritual that would happen. And they would stand me in the middle. I don't know where my grandma uh, got live chickens and live doves, but every time we did this, there would be a live chicken and a live dove, okay? It looked like a Prince video in there, um, but, uh, but, 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 <laughs> I know how doves cry. Uh, you might not know, but I know, okay? Um, so here's what we would do. I kid you not. They would put me in the middle. They would grab the chicken. They would rub the chicken all over me, but specifically on my ear where I was going to get surgery. And then they would essentially rip the chicken's head off and put blood on this, sacrifice, this like altar that was there, okay? Then they would grab the dove and rub the dove all over me. And then they would let the dove go through one of the windows, which represented my illness leaving me. Then I would have to take a bath in this really cold water that had herbs in it, which was like the cleansing thing, which is funny because we talked about the Old Testament tabernacle uh, last week. It's funny how there's, there's some similarities. Obviously, this is a cult, but there was, some similar, there was a sacrifice. There was a scapegoat. There was a cleansing. All those things just in not, you know, the Bible, right? And so then I, when we were, once we were done with the purification process, I would have to wear white until the day of my surgery. That would be like me being purified until it was time. This happened again and again and again and again. I'm six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is just my childhood, not thinking anything of it, okay? So right around that time, uh, my, my grandmother, uh, it, so my mom had to run errands one day. And so she leaves me with my grandmother. I walk across the, the hallway with my little brother and we're over there. My mom comes back from running errands, and when she walks into my grandma's apartment, she finds me on top of the kitchen counter, and it's my grandma and this complete stranger, this woman she had never met, and they have me on the counter with my shirt off, okay? And my mom walks up, and it's, it's almost like they're examining me like I'm a piece of cattle. 
And my mom walks in, she sees this, has no idea what's happening. She tells me to go back to my apartment, and so she confronts my grandma. As she confronts my grandma, my grandma is super excited. She's beside herself. And she says, you're not going to believe who this lady was. This lady is the wife of the guy who I, who essentially is the Pope of Santeria in Cuba. Like, th this is who led my grandma into this faith all the way back in the day, okay? So my grandmother, uh, through demonic possession, was revealed, to, was, was told to her that me, her grandson, would one day replace this guy as the head of Santeria, this, this, this Pope, essentially, of Santeria, and that I was one day going to replace him. So she gets this revelation that she is convinced is from the Spirit, and so she pays for this woman's airfare to come up to Chicago to see if I was what she thought I was. So this lady, she shows up, the wife of the guy, and she brings her this gold ring with a ruby on it, a red ruby on it, and the ring belonged to him. And he essentially confirmed it. Yeah, he will replace me, and at a certain age, I want his father to give him this ring. Okay? So let's pause that story there. That's what happened there. Fast forward a few years. When I'm 18, I come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. I, I'm at a youth retreat. God saves me. It was a miraculous thing. I come to know Jesus. The first person that I want to share the gospel with is my grandmother. So I go to Chicago in that same apartment where all those rituals happen, and I share the gospel with her. And I shared this part, but I'm going to reshare it again. I share the gospel with my cute little grandma. And as I'm sharing the gospel with her, when I get to the part about hell, she starts to smile. Like if I'm telling a joke. And like, and like this evil smile, smile. Like, like it literally, it's like I don't think I've ever been more sure that I was in the presence of a demonic presence. Like she was smiling during the hell part, okay? She lets me finish and she says, I didn't know what you believed, but I want you to know that I'd rather burn in hell than ever believe what you just told me. That's my grandma, okay? So a few years go by, I go from being a Christian to being called into ministry. And the person who's most angry the person who's most livid is my grandma. So much, in fact, that she shows up at my wedding wearing all white in protest. Okay? Because white was the purification. She shows up wearing all white in protest because she was so angry that I was going into Christian ministry and not whatever she thought I was going to do. Right? So how does this all connect? Fast forward to this year. This year. We're now we're here. It's December 2020. My grandmother, so my grandfather passes away in August. My grandmother is on hospice, and it's the middle of December, and we find out that she's about to pass. So I go to Chicago. And when I get to Chicago, my grandma passes away a few days later. Right after she passes away, I get COVID and end up in the hospital. And a few weeks after that, not even a few, a few days after that, my dad gets COVID and ends up on life support. Here, here is what I think happened, okay? And then this is something that the Lord kind of just uh, revealed to me. I am convinced that this is what family uh, uh, curses work like, like the baggage of one generation. Here's how it works. Every person in here is part of a family, and every family has generations. The generation that's older than you is above you. What I am convinced of is that when that generation goes and they pass away, whatever they haven't dealt with, the floor breaks and falls on the next floor. Whatever you don't deal with, parents, you're passing on to your children, okay? And whatever you're not dealing with, grandparents, you're passing on to your grandchildren. And so I am convinced that in the spiritual realm, this is literally the image the Lord, the vision the Lord gave me. And I'm not a charismatic dude like that, but it was of a house, and my grandma and my grandfather were one floor, and when they both passed, that floor broke, and everything that they hadn't dealt with fell on us. And that's why I got sick, and that's why my dad got sick. Now, here's what's crazy. While my dad is sick, this is before he went on the ventilator. He was in the hospital for a few days prior to that. Um, I, like I told you guys when I made that video from Chicago, I wasn't praying. I was in a really bad spot spiritually during that time. But while my dad was sick, I don't know why. Like I was, and I don't usually remember my dreams. I usually remember none of my dreams. But I had a very vivid dream. And in the dream, that ring came up. That same ring that was given to my, my, my dad all those years ago. Because my grandma took it and gave it to my dad. Okay. I don't know why. I was like, I feel like my dad still has this ring. I, I don't know why. So I call my mom the next day and I'm like, Mom, I know this sounds crazy, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to take, if he even has it anymore, 
the ring that dad was given all the way back then, and you need to get rid of it. Like, you need to take it and throw it in a river, the Fox River. I knew exactly what to do with it. I don't know why. It was like the Lord had confirmed it to me. That's what had to happen. So my mom was so busy with everything that she just never got to it, right? Three days later, my aunt, my mom's sister from the other side of the family, who knows none of what I just told you, doesn't know about the ring, doesn't know about Santeria, doesn't know any of this thing I just told you. She is easily the biggest prayer warrior in our family. She calls my mom and says, the Lord just spoke to me. On the side of your husband's bed, there's a white box. I don't know what's in the white box, but you have to take that thing and you have to throw it in water immediately. So my mom connects the two things and she sends my uncle because she was still in the hospital with my dad. My uncle, so on the ride, literally this is when it all happened. On the day when I am driving to Chicago, I got the word that my dad was about to put on a ventilator. I am driving to Chicago. My uncle is FaceTiming me and I had never seen that ring ever. He, he's, he's in my dad's room and sure enough, he opens the thing and there's a white box. He opens the box and there's the ring. And he literally says, he FaceTimes me and says, Will, is this the ring? I'm like, that's the ring. And I'm like, get rid of that thing immediately. And what's crazy, and I didn't even tell the other service this, but what's crazy is my, my Cuban family, who are still very much Santeros, I had to literally, they were praying for my dad to these spirits. And I had to call them and say, I don't, if you're not praying in Jesus' name, I don't need you praying for my father. And one of them found out what I was doing with the ring and tried to like talk me out of it. It was almost like Satan trying to speak through them saying, don't get rid of the ring. Whatever you do, don't get rid of the ring. So we're on our way to Chicago. My dad gets, my uncle gets the ring. He gets rid of it. And on that road, on the way to Chicago, I called Josh Mays because Josh knew the whole story. Our pastor, Josh Mays, and I said, dude, I have no idea what's going to happen to my father, but we are doing a series on spiritual warfare at High Point Church. Here's what's crazy, though, church. And here's why I, I, I would put this in the good news category, everything I just shared with you. There's three reasons why God gets the glory, not Satan. The first reason why God gets the glory and not Satan is because my grandmother, that lady that I told you about, the one who looked at me crazy when I told her about the gospel, that same grandmother, I got a chance to lead her to the Lord before she passed away. And not only that, but then my father, who was on his deathbed, who we didn't know if he was going to make it out of it, God intervened through the removing of that stuff from my family. But just because God is sovereign enough to do it, even if, he, even if we didn't do that, but he did it, and now my dad is fully healthy and alive. But the last thing, and this is my favorite thing, is that it almost feels as if my grandma was partially right. The most ironic thing of all of this is that she was partially right. Because way before I became a Christian, my grandma, let alone a pastor, my grandmother saw something in me. And it almost feels like Caiaphas in the New Testament. When the high priest Caiaphas wants Jesus to die, he, he, he prophesies the gospel, doesn't even realize it. He says, it is better for one man to die than for the whole nation to die. So let's go ahead and betray him. He's prophesying the gospel, even though he doesn't know he's prophesying the gospel. My grandmother saw something in me. She thought one day my grandson is going to be used to have a spiritual impact on this world. The only thing she was wrong about was what team I was going to be on. <laughs> Come on. And was Satan used meant for evil, God used for good. And one of my favorite passages in Revelation is Revelation 12, because there is when Satan finally meets his end. What happens partially in the Old Testament happens completely and fully in the New Testament. And in there, what we discover is that they finally, him and all the demons get thrown into the lake of fire. But what it says there is that they were able to overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And I, I honestly can't think of a clearer picture of that in my life than my life. That is through the blood of the lamb and through the word of my testimony that God gets the glory and not the enemy. So, as we look at this concept of how we battle, 
Here's how I want to conclude. The only way, church, that you and I are ever going to win the daily battle is by realizing and recognizing and embracing that Jesus has already won the ultimate war. It's the only way it works. The only way we will win the daily battle is by remembering that Jesus has already won the ultimate war. Because if we're not careful, church, we might leave this morning thinking that, you know, it's neck and neck, right? Like, like Satan wins one and Jesus wins one. It, we're, we're getting into overtime now, right? This is a nail biter. We're, we're on the edge of our seat here. If we're not careful, we might be tempted to think that the war is still raging. But what the Bible says, I don't know what your Bible says, but what my Bible says is that through his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has utterly and totally and completely defeated and destroyed and disarmed the enemy. Church, what that means is this, which is why this is so important, because through the gospel, Jesus Christ simultaneously disarmed Satan and armed us. That's what the gospel teaches, that at the same time, he disarmed Satan and then armed us. Because here, what we're going to look at in a second is that we were given the armor of God. But what I need you to understand is this. We don't approach this spiritual battle for victory, but we approach it from victory. I'm going to go ahead and say that again because I know somebody missed that, okay? The only way that we are ever going to win this spiritual battle is once we understand that in this battle we are not going for victory, but we are approaching it from victory. You hear what I'm saying? Because Jesus Christ has already won utterly and completely and totally and fully. He's won the war. So we approach our daily life not for victory, but from victory. Not for salvation, but from salvation. Because of what Jesus did for you and for me. Church, and I think that's why it's so important for us to constantly be remembering the gospel. To constantly be putting on Christ. Back in our union series, we talked about being in Christ. We looked at Romans and we said that when we place our faith in Jesus, we are transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ. And so now, and we saw this in Colossians again and again and again, Paul says, make sure that you put off sin, you put off Adam, and you are constantly putting on Christ. But here's what I did not know. I always thought that putting on Christ and putting on the armor of God were two separate things. But what I discovered this week is that putting on Christ and putting on the armor are the exact same thing. That when we place our faith in Jesus, we are, put, we are placed in him. But it's up to us through the remembering of the gospel, through praying, through reading, to, to every day put off sin and put on the Savior. That it is in putting on Christ that we put on the armor. They're not two separate things. They are the same exact thing. Well, how do we know? Because when you look at the description of the armor, Paul uses words like truth and salvation and righteousness. What we discover when we look at scripture is that Jesus Christ and him alone is the true source of truth and of salvation and of peace and of righteousness. He is the very word of God. So when we put on Christ, we put on the armor. And here's something you may not know. But, but you, whenever we talk about the armor of God, as Christians, we automatically go to Ephesians chapter 6. But what if I told you that this isn't the first time in Scripture where the armor of God is brought up? As a matter of fact, if you were a Jew and someone were to bring up the armor of God, you wouldn't go to Ephesians chapter 6 because you didn't have Ephesians chapter 6. You would actually go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, you're like, what, what, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because look what it says in Isaiah 59. You ready for this? You ready for this? Isaiah 59 says this. We see, well, before, we see Paul, we see God. He's looking at the world. He, he's looking at the evil. He's looking at the effects that, that, that the, the, the fall has brought. And look what it says in verse 15. It says, he says, truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Listen to this. 
the Lord saw it. So God sees it, right? It says, and it, deple- it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, get this, church. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. So God sees the brokenness. He sees the sin. He sees everything that we see in this world. He wonders who will be worthy, who will be able to wear this armor. And look what it says in verse 17. I love this. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak according to their deeds so he will repay wrath to his adversaries repayment to his enemies to the coastlands he will render repayment verse 20 and a redeemer will come to zion to those in jacob who turn from transgression so what we see get this he god sees the brokenness he sees the sin he sees the war that needs to be fought and there's no one on earth who can put on the armor, but he's promising that one day someone will wear the armor in our place. And that person is not you. That person is not me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, church. Come on. It's not my battle because it's not my armor. It's his armor. And what we see when we look at this passage is that even though the battle is greater than we thought, praise be to God that the victory is greater than we imagined. That's what we see here. That's what this passage teaches us. That God sends a Messiah and that Messiah was Jesus Christ. You know, I came across a story about a Roman captain. His name was Trajan and what he would do is he was famous because what he would do is whenever he saw one of his soldiers wounded on the floor, he would take off his armor and he would put it on the wounded soldier. And, and just because he, the, the, the chances of them living went, went up because he was giving up his armor. I would argue that Jesus Christ is the greater treasure, who he strips himself of his armor and he puts it on us, not so that we might live, but so that we might certainly live. And in him is where we find our hope and our salvation. And since Jesus put on the armor to win the final war. Now we can put on the armor to win the smaller battles. In Christ Jesus, we find not just our source of strength, but our source of salvation. And I would argue that in order for us to truly appreciate the good news, we have to understand the bad news. In order for us to truly appreciate the magnitude of our victory, and we have to understand the magnitude of our almost certain defeat. Jesus came to give us victory. So now we can approach life not for victory, but from victory. Amen.